Hello friends, welcome to the special lecture symbolic expression and as sign language expert we have Manisha Sharma with us and the theme of today's discussion is Italian cinema and neorealism. Uh, neorealism as a movement uh, began in the Italian cinema in 1940s and 50s and we see that how the characteristics of this particular movement they were concerned with the kind of contemporary situation of Italy in those times that how the fascist movement which was there at that point of time created such kind of conditions that the Italian cinema arose and how the characteristics in the framework of the non-professional actors, simple direction, uh, non-melodramatic dialogues, all these kinds of things, location shootings, etc. all of them they were being incorporated in a neorealism and some of the important filmmakers, those who were concerned with the neorealist cinema in Italy were Robert Rosalini, D. Sica, Visconti, uh, Federico Fellini, De Santis and some others as well. And we find that the way they characterized uh, the characters in the particular film in which uh, in a way which they directed and or made for that matter. And the at the same time the usage of the non-professional actors in the films that uh, many of them they were not in a way typecast in any way in other, in other, other, other films in which uh, they, they have functioned or they have worked. So all these things uh, could be seen in the Italian cinema. Uh, of those times and when you tend to see them in the context of uh, the readings one can talk about Andre Baza, uh, What is Cinema Volume 1 as well as Volume 2. Then Armis Roy Patterns of Realism, A Study of Italian Neorealism. Then Peter Bondanella, the films of Roberto Rosarini. Then Robert Philip Kolker, The Altering Eye, Contemporary International Cinema. Millicent Marcus Italian film in the light of neorealism. So these are some of the readings which one can refer when one is talking about uh, the Italian neorealist cinema and how this cinema also influenced uh, the filmmakers across the world and we find that this kind of a cinema influenced not only uh, in India but in other countries of the world as well. And uh, these filmmakers of these countries, they also engaged in making uh, such kind of films which were referred to as the meaningful or purposeful cinema. So, uh, when we talk about neorealism, we say that it arose in response to the fascist cinema. And this fascist cinema was in the context of the white telephone films which were made in those times and the white telephone films referred uh, to those films which were from the mainstream cinema and in which huge white telephones they were being uh, shown in them and they, la they were largely concerned uh, with only entertainment and uh, neorealist films largely when you see them they were concerned with the contemporary reality and they were talking about the day to day uh, issues of uh, those times. And when we try to understand the neorealist cinema, then we find that initially some of the filmmakers, how when they made their films, for example, Antonio Pietrangeli uh, to Lucino Visconti, all these uh, filmmakers, how they in a way initiated this particular brand of cinema. Obsession or Ossessione was Visconti's film and it is considered to be some sort of a harbinger of the neorealist film or neorealist cinema. And uh, we find that other films which were made in the later times, whether Rome Open City, Shoe Shine, all of them, uh, they were concerned with uh, the problems of uh, those times. And we also see that uh, that was also the period of the post war uh, when the Second World War had ended in 1945. And thereafter, uh, the harbingers of this particular theme of neorealist cinema, they could be seen from 1942 onwards as well. Uh, as you can see on the screen as well that uh, they were dealing with these kinds of themes uh, whether in the context of the uh, working class or in the context of the economic oppression which you find in, the, in those times. Then they were also dealing with the framework of the kind of struggle of the people for the sustenance of their lives and the issues of poverty, they were also there. So when you talk about uh, this kind of a cinema which was neorealist in nature, then they were in a way trying to talk about the kind of challenges which were being posed to the people in the post-war times of uh, that particular era and how people they were dealing with these kinds of issues that that was also being discussed in these particular films and we find that 
when you talk about cinema you also tend to find that how uh, these kinds of issues they were there in the literature as well and the people those who were concerned with literature for example giovanni verga and how he provided the narrative prototype for an alternative to cliche and falsehoods of uh, fascist film industry through his writing tradition of verismo which meant truth and uh, verga was a follower of the realist tradition in the italian art he was concentrating on the less privileged uh, social strata and how the veris they were criticized for having a simplified vision of the world so we find that uh, these kinds of uh, uh, resonances which were there in the italian cinema they could be seen in the uh, framework of uh, the literature where we find that how literature of those times provided that kind of an impetus where nearly cinema could be made and uh, we see that uh, the scholars those who were associated with uh, neorealist cinema they tend to view neorealism as a school of a uh, school in that sense that uh, there were specific features or characteristics which were associated with the neorealist cinema they were talking about some kind of uh, clearly delineated uh, geographic and the temporal boundaries and the group of the masters and the disciples and a set of rules as george sidol talks about and then we also see when uh, this uh, these kinds of films when they came into practice then we find that how location shooting was important uh, natural lighting again was important in the pre- predominance of the medium uh, and the long shots uh, could be seen and we also see that unobtrusive editing was one of the concerns and the respect for the continuity of time and space and the non professional cast all these kinds of factors uh, they were very important in the framework of the neorealist cinema then we see that how uh, during this time uh, it was also asking for the active viewer involvement and uh, many times we find that the working class protagonists they could be seen in the film and the dialogues they were also in vernacular language and uh, most of the time an undevised open ended plot could be seen in the film and uh, it was in a way the use of the contemporary true to life subjects in the film and uh, the film was also trying to imply some kind of a, a social criticism as well so uh, we uh, there were others those who say that the filmmakers those who were associated with the neorealist cinema they never formed any kind of a group and uh, we also find that ma- not many of the films they which fulfill all the rules which have been talked about together so in that sense some kind of a convergence of some of the italian directors at a particular point of time around some of the characteristics which are proposed as norms so the, in from that framework we can try to understand the uh, neorealist cinema and uh, when you talk about how from the point of view of the neorealist the effect of the classical realism does not end with uh, verga's acknowledgement of the disparity between the way things are and the way things should be but goes on to insist on ending that kind of a disparity and uh, as scholar like sandro uh, petralia argues to change things from the way they are to way they should and could be so that kind of a focus is there that how uh, the uh, these kinds of efforts they should be made uh, so that uh, we should make all these kinds of efforts that uh, the way we want the thing should and could be so uh, we should in a way try to focus on those kinds of aspects in the framework of verga's list of essere essere uh, to be and dovere to have to uh, petralia's addition of potere that means to be able to is one of the most important aspects which indicated that the contest between the way things are and the way they ought to be is reconciled by a suitable social action so this highlights the difference between the status quo and the inherent potential of social change and it was very important from the point of view of the neorealists as well and we find that how in a, a neorealism in a way sought to reclaim and reappropriate uh, cinema so as to revamp uh, truth at or trust in the medium's ability to demonstrate the reality as it is and we find that neorealist filmmakers they perpetuated an anti-establishment posture and they depicted an image of Italy that was not reassuring to the italian officialdom and they were denounced for slandering 
Italy abroad. So that was uh, the kind of things which was associated uh, with the people, those who were in a way concerned with the new list cinema and how they were ready to take on uh, the establishment, how they were ready to criticize the kind of official positioning uh, which was there. And uh, we find that not only the filmmakers, but the people, those who were in the writing department, the, the script writers like Zawatini and how uh, they say in their framework that the cinema should accept unconditionally what is contemporary. It must tell reality as it, it were a story. Excavate in illimitable mine of reality, cinema will become socially important. This is what he argued. And uh, if you uh, use uh, living real characters with which to sound uh, reality, uh, then his emotion becomes more effective, morally stronger, more useful. And uh, he wants uh, to meet a real protagonist of the everyday life. So, this is what Zawatini argued and uh, he, his focus largely was in the context of uh, bringing about the social importance of cinema and how these kind of characters, those who are from the day to day reality, uh, they are going to make a much stronger impact as well. And there were other scholars like Marcia Lendi who says that the Neuralist films, they provided direct access to images by meant of long take photography and minimal editing and through media, middle distance shots that could enable viewer to assimilate characters specific relationship to the environment. So, how uh, we find that how these uh, photography, cinematography and the editing they were very very important in the framework of uh, showing the neuralist films. And when uh, you talk about that how the neuralist filmmakers they were ready to criticize the official machinery and how they also uh, in a way wanted to uh, convey that they were anti-establishment in nature and, and it was very natural that how the people those were uh, in the official position that they would retaliate in certain manner. And uh, in that context, we find that how the state retaliated with the censorship norms and Giulio Andrati uh, law which came in 1949 and it had certain provisions to check films uh, portraying Italy in an unflattering light. And the introduction of the strict pre-censorship gave state control over a film industry and the submission of all scripts to a special ministerial commission and the granting of production loans to only those that received official acceptance. So, we find that when the state reacted in a certain manner and how it enacted laws as well and these laws they questioned uh, the kind of portrayal which was being done of Italy and which was not considered to be flattering in nature in those times. And uh, they were talking in that sense that how the pre-censorship uh, which was to be introduced, uh, uh, it was uh, giving some kind of a control o over the film industry as well. And uh, how the scripts, they were to be reviewed uh, by a committee before that when they were being made. So, in this uh, context, we find that some kind of a, a tightening of the screws over uh, the people, those who were making such kind of a cinema that was uh, being done. And uh, the focus of granting that kind of a money to only those films that were receiving the official acceptance that was also another important focus in that context. And uh, many times we find that uh, when the state retaliated a film could be refused and export license on the pretext that it slandered Italy. And we find that the people, those who were making such kind of laws, Andreotti, for example, neuralist films were defaming Italy abroad and portraying her as a nation of social strife, unemployment and poverty. So, we find that when the people, those who were at the helm of affairs, those who were there to take the decisions and they viewed uh, such kind of uh, cinema uh, which was trying to defame Italy, then they took certain steps to stop this. And uh, we find that in February 1948, uh, movement for the defense of the Italian cinema was formed and 10 eminent filmmakers, they denounced the Andreotti laws because Andreotti wanted to in a way uh, suggest that uh, these kinds of films which were being made, they were trying to defame Italy. So, in, in that kind of a defense, uh, we find that the, the, uh, some of the People, those who were associated with the films, they denounced the Andreotti laws in a number of articles uh, which were being published in Renascita, uh, which was a communist weekly on March 3, 1949. 
and we also find that not only the Italian cinema, but also uh, the Nazi cinema which was there in Germany. How uh, we find that Nazis they had also established their own uh, cinema institutions and brought cinema under the control of the Ministry of Propaganda. And we find that the propagandist motives and the activities of the Hitler and his minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, they were clear as both were very keen, keenly aware of the film's ability to mobilize the minds and to create powerful illusions and the captivate audiences as well. So, we find that how the um, uh, Nazis also through uh, the Ministry of uh, Propaganda, how Joseph Goebbels who was also the minister or who was rather the minister of uh, uh, this particular ministry and how these people they were very clear that how they had to in a way restrict uh, the kind of cinema which was being made in uh, Germany at that point of time and how they wanted to bring cinema under the control of the ministry of uh, propaganda because they were very well aware that how cinema has that kind of power, that kind of ability to mobilize the minds and how audience can uh, be captivated by uh, the films as well. So, Lenny Refinsthal was one of the filmmakers and we find that on 20th May 1933 as Minister for Popular Entertainment and Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels stated that the German cinema had the duty of conquering globe as vanguard of Nazi military forces. And Lenny Refinsthal's close association with Hitler and her Nazi ties, they resulted in the production of Triumph of Will in 1935 and cinematographic, it was film which was cinematograph, cinematographic equivalent of Hitler's uh, defecation through monumental architecture. So, we find that how uh, this particular film was in a way trying to um, show that Hitler was some kind of a deity, uh, he was a very big kind of force and uh, Lenny de Finstal, who was uh, not only associated with this uh, particular film, but she also made another film Olympia, uh, where again uh, her focus is on the uh, Nazi cinema. And uh, we find that in this particular film, which was the triumph of the will, Hitler was shown in Nuremberg uh, Nazi party rally, where a huge rectangular uh, tribune was built. And this architectural uh, stage was designed to enhance the image of Hitler as a savior of the masses. And we find that as I told you Lenny Refinsthal made Olympia which was again a film which was trying to praise Nazism. And uh, we find that a number of left wing and the Jewish filmmakers they in a way ran away from uh, Germany to other European countries uh, because of the kind of anti-Semitic and anti-communist propaganda which was there from the state. And we find that many people from the film industry uh, they ran away from Germany. Uh, to other nations of the world. So, it was in a way some kind of a loss to Germany when these uh, when these genius filmmakers they ran away from Germany to other nations and it was some sort of a gain uh, to these nations that they were able to receive uh, these filmmakers. So, we find that uh, even the Italian cinema of the fascist rule from 1922 to 1943 has been seen as a cinema of propaganda and we find that under the fascist rule cinema that was being created was detached from the reality and it was aimed at promoting an excellent image of Italy. And we find that the neuralist films, uh, uh, we find that there was a reaction against the white telephone films as I told you earlier as well and which were pretentious in nature and in which character to talked on the white shining phones. So, that was uh, the kind of cinema uh, the, which was uh, before the nearest films and these films they were more concerned with the issue of entertainment and they were trying to detach themselves from any kind of a reality which existed in the Italian uh, society of those times. So, in that uh, context when we try to position uh, a neorealism then we find uh, that uh, how the filmmakers uh, they were trying to position neorealism and how it emerged in the response to this uh, genre which dealt in the imagination as well as uh, fantasy. And uh, so, uh, neorealist cinema was in a way some sort of a uh, movement against the artificiality of the pre-war and the fascist cinema. 
and the focus of the Nirlal cinema was to make uh, films more and more meaningful and purposeful uh, for the audience that how the audience they are able to gain uh, something from uh, these kinds of films which were made. And when we tend to understand the people those who were trying to view these kinds of films and they were trying to understand them in a particular kind of a context. Then humanists like Andre Baza, they explain the neuralist phenomena, phenomena in terms of its moral content that how the moral content was important in the neuralist films and he sees the basic humanism of the contemporary Italian films as their principal merit. And for Baza, we find that mise en scene is a sense of uh, the neuralist film. And by mise en scene, he refers to the deep focus photography and the sequence shot and how these devices they permit audience to be more involved in the viewing of the film. So, we find that how uh, the people those who were in a way associated in terms of understanding of the cinema, how uh, they were not only trying to see realism or neorealism, uh, not so much as a technique that can one exercise or an effect which is being induced in viewer. But rather uh, it was seen as some sort of an attitude or a position that a filmmaker adopts in relation to the subject matter. And when you tend to understand uh, it in the framework of the people those who have worked, then social historians like Umberto Barbaro in Italy and Giorgio Sedol in France and how they postulate neorealism as an exclusive articulation of the war and the anti-fascist resistance with stress on the social concern. So, we will talk further about the ideas of uh, the filmmakers, uh, those who are in a way uh, connected to the neuralist films as well as the theoreticians, those who have talked about the neuralist cinema and how they have tried to in a way critically analyze the films which have been made within the framework of neorealism in our next lecture. Thank you very much.